How services of belligerent armies in the First World War entered the conflict with a challenge. In the 19th century, armies lost soldiers to diseases. So during wartime, one of the biggest challenge was to maintain soldiers alive, not as a result of combat, but as a result of typhoid or dysentery or cholera. So in the 19th century, oftentimes the tolls was greater because of diseases than combat. So when the First World War broke out, health services knew that they were going to be um, key to the success of the armies. Of course, there was a massive learning curve and it took them quite a while to organise themselves because the scale of the conflict was unprecedented. Now, how services of different armies in the First World War uh, entered the war prepared to treat soldiers from the wand, from combat wand, but also from diseases. And the point of treating soldiers was, of course, to return them to the battlefront as soon as possible uh, so they could fight the war. Now, one issue, among the many issues that they didn't foresee, are corpses. What do you do with them? They kept on piling up at a rate that was unprecedented in military history. Just to give you an example, on the 22nd of August 1914, in the French army alone, 28,000 soldiers were killed or died. Now this, on one day, is a massive amount of corpses to deal with. Now imagine other armies, the British, the Russians, you name it, on different front. Dead kept piling up day after day after day. And why were corpses a problem? Well, because when we die, corpses petrify, and they petrify and they become agent for path pathogens. So by this I mean that bacteria multiply. This is, of course, the process of putref putrefaction. But when you take soldiers who were sick of maybe diphtheria, cholera, dysentery, yellow fever, these bacteria and even viruses can remain in corpses for quite a while. And so, when the bodies are not being taken care of, they become a real bacterial bomb. They become a real epidemiologic threat, and they need to be disposed of. Now, because corpses were such an issue, armies of different belligerent nations came up with strategies to dispose of the bodies. I call it body disposal. Um, it's not an elegant term because we often think of, you know, commemoration and bodies of soldiers being very important, and they are, culturally speaking. But the challenge that these armies had to face was to get rid of the dead as quickly as possible in order to prevent the spread of contagion, of contamination. And this could happen by um, relation to the corpses, when you handle the corpses, this could happen if the corpses were not uh, being taken care of and would remain on the battlefield for weeks, for months. This would happen if corpses were badly interred and would resurface. Um, this would also happen as a result of heavy rain or streams of water where um, bacteria would infiltrate the water and could potentially, indeed, uh, contaminate civilian populations. So taking care of corpses was an essential element of the First World War. How did the armies did this? Well, they organised many policies and strategies to um, bury the corpses or cremate them as effectively as possible. Um, the amounts were so great that you can find pictures in the archives of pre-dug mass graves. So I'm talking of very large graves which were dug before battles in expectation that the dead would fill them up. And indeed, they did. Um, armies created masks so that grave diggers could um, breathe, literally, uh, in, in these mass graves. They tried uh, cremation processes in order to um, dispose of the corpses and they set up a wide array of policies and practices to safely dispose of corpses um, after a battle 
or even long after a battle when corpses hadn't been uh, cleared from the battlefield. Now, First World War body disposal methods, as difficult as they may seem to us in a, in a peacetime society, um, were overall very efficient and very effective in preventing the spread of um, diseases. Now, think about armies as um, groups of people that are quite mobile, even in a First World War context. You add to this uh, the risk of contamination through um, corpses, potentially this could have gone wrong. Um, but when you look at the First World War, casualties were far higher through artillery, through combat, than through um, epidemics. And this is really a massive transition for military history. Um, this has been well documented by historians of medicine, where you see that in the 19th century, armies are much more likely to lose soldiers because of diseases and epidemics than because of combat. With the First World War, you see the opposite. A greater amount of men died as a result of combat-inflicted wounds um, than diseases. And in such way, you can say that the medicine of the First World War was much more effective, but also the precautionary measures that they took to prevent infection and the outbreak of diseases. And one of those measure, measures sorry, was uh, body disposal. And when you look at infection rate, when you look at the way body were uh, taken care of and disposed, you can say that mostly measures taken in the large armies of the First World War were quite successful in preventing the outbreak of diseases related to the putrefaction of corpses. Now, it is well known that corpses have an enormous cultural importance. I mean, the history of the Homo sapiens is really related to the way we, uh, as a species, have been able to take care of the dead and farewell them um, in the afterworlds, if you believe in an afterworld, or to say goodbye. So death is surrendered by social practices that are very significant uh, to who we are. And of course, in the context of the First World War, families were deprived of the corpses. Uh, in most instances, the dead were disposed of after combat if they could be found, because remember the First World War um, is the war of the unknown soldier where bodies are literally um, blown to pieces and can't be interred. Now, after the First World War, population demanded that corpses be returned to them. And in some cases it was possible. Um, for example, uh, the American army made sure to uh, ship back some of its dead to the US, American dead who had died in, in France, for instance. Um, the British army made a different choice whereby um, the dead would remain where they had been killed or where they died. So in that sense, colonial armies such as that of New Zealand or Australia or South Africa, uh, the dead remained where they were. But they had to be commemorated because, of course, uh, the families wanted to make sure that soldiers were buried properly. So immediately after the First World War, what you observe is millions, millions of corpses being exhumed from provisional graves, from mass graves, to be re-entered individually in what we know today as military cemeteries. And when you go to these military cemeteries, you see individual graves, some of them with names on the graves, as the soldiers were able to be identified. And you see these very peaceful military cemeteries with flowers and green grass. Um, and part of these cemeteries have really served to heal and to provide fitting commemoration uh, for these dead um, across the world. But these cemeteries, to some respect, have hidden the atrocity of the First World War. Um, they have made an absolute horrific slaughter experience look like organised row 
of man after man after man being properly interred. But this happened as a result of the post-war period where families uh, required appropriate commemoration. Initially, the dead weren't buried in such ways.